Greetings and salam. My name is Reginald Royston. I pre-recorded this talk from Madison, Wisconsin in the United States. And I apologize I cannot be with you all today for this important discussion on Ghana's tech futures. I've helped to organize this, these panels with Saram Avale with the support of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Holtz Center for Science and Technology Studies. And breaking with convention, this discussion is almost entirely composed of Ghanaian scholars who are experts on technology and development in Ghana. I'm a diasporan and African-American and Afro-Puerto Rican from the United States. I feel honored to be a part of this esteemed company. And I would also like to acknowledge the passing away of, uh, the passing away of an important black American Ghana scholar, Louis E. Wilson, over this past weekend. For over 10 years, I've looked at the relationship between digital media producers in Ghana's diaspora and tech entrepreneurs in the homeland. Thinking about homeland diaspora relations in Ghana in this digital era can help us unlock a vision of a truly Pan-African future. The concept of digital diaspora is central to my current book project, so some definitions are necessary. As I state in a recent article, Configuring Ghana's Diaspora, Digital diaspora represents both a virtual community and a community of ICT practice. It is not only the media of diaspora or online communities or websites such as Ghana Motion or Ghana Web, both of which are uh, uh, based abroad, headquartered abroad, but also the formal and informal tactics of Ghanaians in diaspora who are using digital medias. Ultimately, I would like to argue that digital diaspora is a technology in itself. Technology is often described as a means of overcoming problems, gaps, and failings. So what does the social and technical innovation of digital diaspora help us to overcome? Manuel Castells advanced the notion of the network society in the 1990s, and quickly the idea was taken up by utopian pundits and the public sphere uh, embracing the idea that the internet would flatten the world. This idealism is hardly borne out in statistics. The second largest continent, Africa, has the fewest digital connections to the external internet. Looking at this image provided by the mapping service Telegeography and the United Nations, we see that the continent has fewer physical cables than either Asia North America and Europe have to each other. Also, hyperscale cloud servers, the likes of which are, which are operated by Facebook, Amazon, or IBM, are few and far between on the continent. Most cloud servers that serve Africa are headquartered or based in Europe. Now, while Africa's mobile phone industry has become the most robust regional market in the world since the early 2000s, the comparative price of devices and the cost of data connections as a percentage of personal spending power remain highest for consumers in Africa. Ghana, however, has been a leader in African internet connectivity. It was amongst the first West African nations to obtain regular access to the internet in the 1990s, and, when, and it was an early leader in mobile telephony with firms such as Spacephone and Mobitel. At the height of telecom development in 2014, Ghana had six national providers of mobile internet access. And today Ghana is a worldwide leader in mobile money and person-to-person -person electronic payment systems. Yet between homeland and diaspora, there's a disjunctive communication culture that constantly requires users to calibrate their connection strategies. If you look in this slide here, I have one column that describes the infrastructure of data connections for those living in the homeland in Ghana, and another for those living in diaspora in the West, primarily in the United States and Europe. So you can compare some of the downsides. For instance, uh, Ghanaians suffer from uh, intermittent access to electricity, which ultimately impacts internet access, lower bandwidth, and proprieta proprietary networks or walled gardens. Uh, some of the upsides of the Ghanaian internet system or the broad mobile broadband include uh, wireless-based internet access, a reliance and usage 
of SMS uh, as, a, as a communications technique. Uh, Africa and Ghana in particular were amongst the leaders in WhatsApp adoption, in, in fact, forcing diasporans, those living abroad, to start using WhatsApp to connect back home. And mobile devices, switching between mobile devices, relatively easy. In the diasporan uh, scenario, while there is robust bandwidth and free Wi-Fi in many places, um, connecting back home is a bit difficult with mobile devices. International calling fees are extremely exorbitant. In addition, the other affordances of being in diaspora, obviously, with that high bandwidth, include a desktop-centric culture, which promotes uh, prosumption or content production. So many theorists have utilized the concept of digital diaspora to describe the media of diasporas or virtual communities such as, let's say, Ochiami.net. <clears throat> in my field work since 2011 in the United States, in California, and in Europe, in the Netherlands, uh, in Amsterdam, and on the ground in Ghana, I've examined informal, community-based, and commercial attempts to bridge the technical and information gap between home and abroad. And this slide illustrates just a few things. Um, what you'll see is Jamila Abdullahi, who's a social entrepreneur, produces the blog Circumspect, for many years has been utilizing video technology to connect diasporans who are maybe experts in African development or who are active in African elections across the continent to each other and connecting Ghanaians who are based uh, in diaspora to the, de the news and political developments that are happening back to home. So while, let's say, Google Plus wasn't necessarily intended as a diaspora homeland technology, it has been utilized and iterated in, in these kinds of ways. I also want to highlight some of the kind of informal practices. If you also see up there, what you see is the Magic Jack, which was an early voice over internet protocol device uh, available to those who were not quite savvy with the internet in the mid-2000s. Uh, simply, the device could be plugged into a computer using a USB connection, and then a telephone cord could connect to that device. That telephone cord and the, the device itself allowed you to have a, a, either a US number or a number from Canada uh, that would allow those who are living in the homeland to have a number that those in diaspora could call, reducing the charges of international fees considerably. Now, obviously, you needed an internet connection to make that work, but again, this was a workaround uh, against the structures of the internet. I also have a picture of calling cards, and while that might seem a bit dated, calling cards are still used throughout the diaspora in the United States to connect back to home. Again, these are iterative technologies. We can also think about other practices um, and other platforms. I mentioned Ghana Web. Ghana Web continually designs and tools its platform uh, to be available and to work within the low bandwidth requirements in Ghana itself. Ghana Web is based in Amsterdam. It was started by a Dutch proprietor who is married to a Ghanaian woman. It is now uh, a conglomerate that has over presences in over five different African countries. Some other media, local media, uh, diaspora productions that I'd like to highlight include some of the programming coming out of Salto, which is a community access, um, a community media company uh, publicly owned, in, again in Amsterdam, that offers a range of programming, including Adani TV and the Black Stars Radio. Uh, broadcast, which is broadcast again over the internet and entirely again in Ashanti Tree. So there are many examples of this. The last one I'd like to highlight quickly is the Progressive Mind Show, which is based in both Chicago and Atlanta. And Progressive Mind Show is hosted by Senna Aliko, who is uh, the host for, who's been the host for the past five years, based in Chicago. And here in this this slide we see images of representatives of both the NPP, NDC, and CODIO discussing the results and aftermath of the 2020 elections. This is a weekly program and it is a very robust discussion often about uh, trans pan-African ideas as well as diaspora homeland relationships and we can see the connections and synergies between homeland 
and diaspora, again, are happening in real time with programs such as this. Permit me to narrate a unique experience from the field that for me demonstrates the potential of Ghana's digital diaspora serving as a global force. One of the most important events in digital diaspora I documented in 2020 is referred to as the Virtual Ghana Fest. In 2020, Chicago's Ghana Fest, the largest such Ghanaian homecoming festival in the United States, typically held in July, was made virtual due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Organizers of the event, the Ghanaian National Council of Chicago, proposed, instead of a festival in the park, a live web-streamed affair hosting celebrities, musicians, and cultural presentations for the community. This transnational broadcast across Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and DTV, Diaspora, television, Diaspora News Television, an online channel based in Ghana, would feature performances and speakers in Chicago, as well as feeds from the homeland. In Chicago, the Ghanaian community numbers at least 30,000, and it is a mid-sized African immigrant community for the United States. Ghana Fest started in the 1980s at the Southside Washington Park. At its peak in the 1990s, it hosted over 10,000 attendees. American politicians, Ghanaian cabinet ministers, and MPs make regular visits. Visiting off and on since 2008, I've seen a beloved uh, storytellers, and I've seen dignitaries such as former presidential candidate Papa Kwesi Ndoum. 2020's virtual Ghana Fest was more of an online performance than a festival or family reunion. In my role as a virtual participant observer, I deployed over five screens to follow the events across social media. In addition to the actual footage of the event on YouTube, more than four hours. My research team screenshot more than a hundred photos and interacted with more than a dozen people. On Facebook, there were ultimately more than 800 views of the event that day and 278 comments on its message board. A year later, the video had been viewed more than 8,000 times. On July 25, 2020, the official feed started off with a pre-recorded montage of attendees dressed in daishikis and African tricolors, walking towards the ticket stand of Ghana Fest in years past. The shot fades to an image of an esteemed mother dressed in head wraps and beads, blowing a welcoming kiss to the camera, followed by fade-ins of Ghanaian cultural symbols. The wooden staff of an Ochiami, a royal processional umbrella covered in Adinkra symbols and porcupines, a derber of elders seated in formation around the parade square, Elder black men and women wearing gold crowns, necklaces, and the rings of office. Everyone draped in voluminous kente cloth stoles. The accompanying soundtrack to the video features a man singing out, You are welcome home. Akwaba. You've been kept down for much too long. Stand up, please, and say I am free. Don't forget, you are welcome home. Welcome home. The images pan over vendor stands. Kenke and smoked fish, woven raffia baskets, and leather purses and sandals. Beads, soaps, and fashion cloths hang on racks. The slogan of the Ghana National Council of Chicago rises on the screen, beyond the year of return, building our community. The recording stops and a live feed from Chicago starts. A GNCC official begins to speak to an assembled crowd of 50 or so people at a discreet nightclub in Chicago that serves as the local soundstage. Welcome to a virtual screening of our Ghana Fest. We've had to do this because of the coronavirus. Today we have in stock for you a show not only from Chicago, but, for, but from 4,000 miles away, bringing you a cross-section of what Ghana's culture is all about. The MC Nana Marfo, host of a local web show, acknowledges guests by name at the nightclub. He faces outward from the stage, but not necessarily into the camera. Ralph Reed, a production company, the local Chicago firm producing the feed, uses multiple cameramen, stage front, stage left, stage right, and close-ups of the band. Occasionally, the camera pans to the invited special guests, surgical masks dangling, dangling from faces and chins. The speakers and 
performers routinely worked the live crowd while at times directly addressing the audience at home. Watching via YouTube or Facebook, the audience assumes the producers are actively monitoring the message boards. The enduring pandemic prompts a few cautions from people online. Please, social distance, please, you are too close together. God bless. Nana, please put up your mask. The event lasts four hours and includes a cooking class, a fashion show, and a gospel and high life performances from Ghana. The Accra portions seem pre-recorded, but the Takradi show seems live. The gospel singer Nasi finally appears, slowly grooving with the music's loping pulse. He speaks and sings in a combination of English and a country. I had a dream recently. The entire world was in sadness. Everyone was crying about Corona. Everyone was saying, Corona, hear me, Corona. Corona will be subdued. Ghana Fest, we have God. Therefore, we do not fear anything. At the end of the event, I participated in a Zoom-based dance party with DJ Bill Bonsu broadcasting from his home in suburban Chicago. The video feed showed the DJs spinning music from a laptop and turntables. If the YouTube comments evoked a degree of public address, digital orality, the simultaneity of the Zoom dance party was undeniable. Over 80 participants listened to Bonsu mix and blend African and American R&B, hip life songs, Afrobeats, and other popular music. Mothers and daughters captured selfie videos, while others danced at the screen, standing close to the cameras. One person had the video on while they worked an outdoor grill. Others simply broadcast their faces, absorbing it all from their backyard, smiling and in awe. I think we can celebrate Virtual Ghana Fest. For many, it would never substitute the joy and effervescence of being in a park celebrating Ghana with loved ones. But for the pandemic, it is a triumph, and for Ghana's digital diaspora, a representational triumph. However, as scholars, we must acknowledge not all diasporic representations and digital flows represent evenly. After all, technology is also described as an ambivalent tool, both good, bad, but also indifferent, as one famous description tells us. Questions arise when diasporic representations, such as in the web series An African City, or Beyonce's Black is King, create incomplete images of the homeland, utilizing what I call a diasporic gaze. Further, we might also contest the detrimental flows of digital diaspora technologies in the case of Ablo Bleshi, the infamous e-way site in Accra, where impoverished young people from the north are often enticed to migrate to southern Ghana, working amid the digital refuse of recycling centers. Unfortunately, time permits just one provocation for further research, and I welcome your questions during Q&A. How can diaspora flows be both liberating tech and tech-savvy without being extractive? Thank you very much.